in such a, a precious holy moment, we're reflecting on the fact that your blood was so precious. One drop of blood excusing 10 trillion billion sins on our behalf and every person in the world would put their faith in you. What a power in your blood. Lord, we just want to be focused on you today. We just want to focus on how great you are. You have done great things. You are a great God. You are a great Savior. You are so merciful. You are so great. You are so holy. You are so wondrous. You are so awesome. You are just so wise. It's you, Jesus, that we stand in awe of this morning. We stand in awe of you, Jesus, for all you are and all that you've done. Lord, I pray, have your way with us right now. Have your way with everyone that's online on the stream, everyone that's in this church, even the kids in their classrooms. Lord, we just want to hand over our life to you and say, have your way with us, and we want to hand over this time to you. We want to say, have your way. Direct our focus to you, Lord. Let nothing else compete with you, King Jesus. Have your way with us, we pray, and lead us in this time. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, you guys can take your seats. Uh, if you're online, you're already, you're already on your seats, so that's cool. Thanks, Dunks. Uh, my name is James, uh, if you haven't met me, by the way, and welcome to you if you are new. And uh, we are in the series, The Cost and the Crown in the Gospel, according to Mark. We've been in Mark quite a bit this year, and we will continue to be. But it's important for me to stress at the front end of this preach that this passage in Mark that we're going to take a look at today is not like one of the many miracles of Jesus or one of the many teachings that Jesus did. This passage is an event that happened once and once only. And in some ways, it's the most vital piece of Mark that we should take our eyes and look at because this is a picture of the Christ as he is now and that we will stand before one day. And it is the transfiguration of Jesus in Mark chapter 9. If you're a, a person that likes to turn there in your physical Bible, like this gentleman over here, God's going to bless you. If you take notes like this lass over here, God's going to bless you. You get heaven points. You don't know if you know that. If you take notes... Uh, but before we unpack Mark 9, I just want to connect the dots between this week's preach and last week's preach, because if you were not here last week, can I tell you, you missed out. It was a very powerful preach from Duncan and a very important one. But not only that, but Mark 9 follows so tightly from Mark chapter 8, that if you only have this sermon, not last week's sermon, you don't have the full package, because this is really two sides of the same coin. As Duncan looked at the cost, the cost to Jesus, which, by the way, we just sung about, and the cost of following Jesus, which he preached so well on, the cost from last week, and this week's preach on the crown, we need the cost and the crown together. One without the other is not the full gospel. And so, just by way of reminder, a few notes from last week. When Peter confesses Jesus to be the Christ, Jesus says, that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. Quite frankly, this is a bitter pill to swallow for the disciples. Many of them left home, family, and business in order to follow Jesus. And he's like, guess what? I'm going to die. This is a tough moment for them. But not only was there this cost to Jesus, but he goes on to say, if anyone would come after me. If anyone wants to be a Christian, a Christ follower, let him deny himself and take up his cross, which Duncan helped us see is a picture of death, and follow me. This is also a bitter pill to swallow for the disciples. It was a bitter pill for us last week. But the disciples are in a place of discouragement after this. And God, sensing that they have been knocked flat, by their discouragement, is about to do something incredible. He's about to pull open the curtain or the veil, if you want, and show them a picture of the future, that they might see that beyond the rejection, 
there shall be a reward. And that beyond the thorns, there shall be a throne. And that beyond the cross, there shall be a crown. And he shows them a picture of the second coming of Christ in all of his glory as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he does this by showing them a preview, a sneak peek, a trailer of that future glory right here, right now on the mountain. And this is the picture that we need because this is the Jesus we will see. And so let's read from Mark chapter 9 if you're in your physical Bible. If not, you can read behind me. It says this, And he, that's Jesus, said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. And six days, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. He led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And then appeared with him Elijah and Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said, Rabbi, it's, it's good. It's good that we are here. Let, let's make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. And so for me, for my points for today, if you're taking notes, you're getting those heaven points. Uh, for me, the, the passage divides itself up naturally into these four headings. Number one, the promise of glory. That's verse one, where Jesus says, I'm going to give you this promise. Secondly, the presence of glory, where we see the transfiguration of Jesus in verses two to three. And then we have the prophets of glory rocking up, verses four to six. And then lastly, the purpose of glory that the Father explains from that clouds on that day. So we've got those four headings, and first and foremost, we're going to take a look at the promise that Jesus gives at the front end, the promise of his glory, which is in verse 1. In verse 1, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you. Now Jesus is the living word. Everything he says is true. So when he makes a point to say, truly I say to you, it is serious business. In fact, no one uses this phrase in all of Scripture, not Peter, James, John, none of them, Jesus and Jesus alone, for it indicates a solemn warning or truth is about to come from his lips, and it carries the same authority as, thus saith the Lord from the Old Testament. And so he says to them, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death. That means they will not die. Until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. Now we find that those some are Peter, James, and John as the passage unfolds. And that they're going to see the kingdom of God come in power in the form of this trailer sneak preview of God's glory up on the mountain today. And that preview is a preview of Christ in his power of his second coming. It's worthy for me before we carry on with this passage to just turn aside for a moment and talk a little bit about that second coming. For those of you that are not familiar, we are first and foremost living in a world that suffers under great spiritual darkness. If you keep up with the news, you will know this to be true. And the biblical counsel is that it's not going to get better, it's going to get darker as the age draws near. But when all seems lost, Christ the King will come and He will come with power. It says this in Matthew 24, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. We've heard in the series how that's Jesus. And all the tribes on the earth will mourn, for they will see the Son of Man coming on a cloud from heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 25 says, when the Son of Man comes with glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. It's important for us to log just the stark contrast between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. I've, I've made a little table for your enjoyment. Firstly, when Jesus came the first time, 
He came as a lowly bond servant, a meek Messiah. But when he comes again, he shall come as the great sovereign king of kings and the Lord of lords. When Jesus came the first time, he comes lowly, riding on a donkey on Palm Sunday on the way to Jerusalem. But when he comes again, he shall come with the angel armies riding a white stallion. And he who sits on the stallion, his name is faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. The first time that Jesus came, he stood before Pontius Pilate in judgment. But the second time that Jesus comes, Pontius Pilate will stand before him in judgment. The first time that Jesus came, he wore a crown of thorns. But when he comes again, he shall wear a crown of many diadems. The first time Jesus came, he poured out his blood for us at Calvary. But the second time that Jesus comes, he wears a robe that is dripping with blood, the very blood of his enemies that he has slain. And when Jesus came the first time, he stood alone, forsaken by his disciples and everyone else. But the second time that Jesus comes, he shall be surrounded by the heavenly hosts and all will see him. It's important for us, I've even stepped aside out of the shot, for us to take a look at that right-hand column. Because when you next see Jesus, he ain't going to be a stonemason, he's not going to be a lowly bondservant, that's the Jesus that you will next lay eyes upon. And it's important, therefore, for us to log. This is not some fluffy Jesus. This is the Christ, the Messiah, the Almighty One, holy, terrifying, worthy of worship, that we should bow down and honor Him. This is the Jesus that we shall stand before one day. And so the application is, these guys, why did they receive the sneak preview? Because they were discouraged. They were discouraged by this discussion about the cost to Jesus and the cost to following him. But they needed to be bolstered in their souls, and we need to be bolstered in our souls, that no matter how dark things might become in our life and how difficult the road and how high the cost it might be to follow Jesus, that the darker the days go, the lighter and the brighter does the hope of the second coming shine when Jesus will reward his faithful. And that they were discouraged on that day, they were to be encouraged by this preview. We are to be encouraged by this preview as well. As the author C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he speaks about Aslan, who represents Jesus. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, there shall be spring again. So be of good courage. This world will meet its appointed end. Be of good courage. Jesus will come again. Be of good courage. He will reward his faithful, and he will start the new heavens and the new earth, and Jesus wins in the end. Be of good courage. The promise of glory. Number two, the presence of glory. Now, as we turn to verse two, Jesus is about to take with him three dudes, Peter, James, and John. They're going to be the future leaders in the church. And so this is intentional training. And Jesus brings them up on a very difficult high mountain climb. At night, we read, Jesus ain't messing about. These three are coming up there. It says, and after six days, he took with them Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. By the way, high mountain, Jesus has... A, God has a habit throughout the Old Testament of meeting his people up on the high lofty mountains separated from the things that are below. And there it says, he was transfigured before them. A word that we don't often use unless we are referring to the subject taught at Hogwarts uh, that Professor McGonagall uh, teaches, transfiguration. Uh, but to study this word transfigured is very interesting because the Greek word that is metamorpho, translated as transfigured, is where we get the English word from metamorphosis, which you will know a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It undergoes a metamorphosis, a change of the outside. Not that anything internally has changed, but something on the external has changed. And what has happened on that day was Jesus 
underwent a physical transfiguration or transformation or metamorphosis on the outside to reveal who he was on the inside and all along. Consider this. This is so important. That Jesus always looked like just a normal dude, a lowly servant. But while he still clothed himself with the rags of humanity, underneath all that he remained truly God in all power and terrible holiness and awesomeness at every second. And that people insulted him, spat on him, treated him like dirt and said he's from a nowhere town and he's a nobody. Meanwhile, underneath that, he is the God who breathed everyone into existence and upheld this world by the power of his word. And in one moment on this mountain, the internal reality of Jesus is burst open onto the outside in a blaze of radiant glory. And it says this in verse 3, And his clothes became radiant white intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. It sounds like a cleaning detergent ad straight from heaven. We know how Omo is tough on stains. But this is some next level. This is whiter than Plascon Brilliant White, if you've bought that before. This is holy white. This is white majestic. This is white from heaven. This is white with not a hint of gray. This is white that is so white that if it were here, it would be blinding to you, for it's the white as no eye on earth has ever seen. Jesus was transfigured that day and was revealing his glorious. He is the Lord of light. He is the one. And so that day, it was a preview of when Jesus comes again, the glorious white of the final day. As theologian Sam Storm says, Jesus will come bathed in radiant splendor, enveloped within the atmosphere of indescribable brilliance, surrounded by the ear-piercing praise of the angels and saints, scintillating light from his eyes, irresistible power pouring from his hands. None will deny his beauty. Glory to God. And on this day, Jesus' glory came out, out on the outside. Even his face was changed. According to Matthew's account, his face shone like the sun. Can you imagine? When's the last time you stood a few paces away from the sun? The answer is none of us because we would die. It is no coincidence that throughout the Old Testament, if you came into contact with God's glory, you died. He's way too good. He's way too holy to stand in his presence. You know, this, his face shone like the sun has happened before. In Exodus, we read how Moses' face shone from the reflection of the glory of God. Like the moon reflects the light of the sun. But what happened on this mountain with Jesus is different. Jesus was not reflecting a second-hand glory that came from God. He himself, from within him, was emanating the full, holy, glorious presence of of God himself. This is him directly. And Dorothy Sayers, author, she says, the transfiguration reveals the eternal splendor of Christ, a glory not borrowed, but inherent, showing the disciples the true nature of their master, who though he walks on the earth as a man, is ever the light of the world. That is why John would say in John 1, 14, we have seen his glory, glory as the only son of the father. It's why Peter would write, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We ourselves heard his very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And the same glory which caused Elijah and Moses to shield their face, the same glory which caused Isaiah to say, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And the same glory which blinded the apostle Paul for three days is here unveiled and ripped open in a sneak preview of the final day when Jesus comes in glory, but on that day to the disciples. The presence of glory. Wow. Imagine being there. But wait, there's more. Now we've got the prophets of glory. 
They are as if the unbridled glory of Jesus was not enough to make them stagger. Here we have appearing with them two Old Testament figures. It says in verse 4, they appeared with them Elijah and Moses. Incredible. But why them? What? Why, if there's some testimonials coming from Old Testament dudes that this is the Christ, that he must suffer and die, why Moses and Elijah? Well, firstly, let's think about Moses. Moses is the greatest leader in Israel's history up until Jesus. In the sense of authority, he was like a king, even though he never sat on a throne. In his word and message, he was like a prophet, and in his service to people, he was a priest. And he was the author of the first five books of the Bible that we call the law. God saw fit for this man to be the mediator that would bring the holy law and perfect law of God to people. So if there was ever someone who was worthy to bring a testimony that Jesus is the Christ and that he must suffer and die, surely it's Moses. But if not Moses, then surely Elijah. For if Elijah, if Moses was the great writer of the law, Elijah was the great guardian of of that law. He fought against every violation of that law with great words, prophecies of judgment and miracles. He opposed kings and commoners. This man stood in representation of all the prophets that had ever come. And so in Moses and in Elijah, we have two figures. One represents the entire law of God and one represents all the prophets that came. And so in this moment, we have the law and the prophets, which means the whole Old Testament as one inspired finger is pointing to Jesus saying, he's the Messiah and he must suffer and die. There is no better testimony that could have been brought than these two to stand on that mountain. And it says that they were talking with Jesus. Actually, before we get to the talking, there's another layer to uncover. In fact, there's a few layers. I'm just going to give you one. If you're in our institute class, you know the six, but I'm going to give you one more. There's another layer that I find extremely important, and that is that Elijah and Moses had beheld the glory of God in the Old Testament. However, they had never known the humanity of God in Jesus. On the other side, Peter, James, and John, they know only the humanity of Jesus and what they do not know is the glory of God. So in the words of our early church father, Ephraim the Syrian, the prophets, that's Moses and Elijah, they rejoiced when they saw his humanity they had not known. But the apostles, Peter, James, and John also rejoiced because they saw the glory of his divinity, which they had not known. And so on this mountain, you have this crowning confirmation. Jesus is truly man. Yes. And Jesus is is truly God. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. Not 50%, 50%, not even 100%, 100%. He's truly and at all times in His earthly ministry. Both of those things. And no one else could testify to that unless you had Old Testament saints who didn't know His humanity, that knew the glory of God, and New Testament disciples that didn't know His glory. But together, they're the crowning confirmation that in Jesus, truly God, truly man, here he stands. No one else could have paid the price. We sang about the blood. No one else could have paid the price except that God himself, being the son of God, would excuse and save. But also we needed someone who was tempted and tried as we are, a man, and he was truly man. If he wasn't truly man and truly God, we wouldn't have a savior. But as it is, he is the son of man. He is the son of God. And this is the moment where we get the best confirmation in the Bible that this is true. So this is a holy moment. <laughs> Jesus is radiating like the sun. And now Moses and Elijah are here. This is insane. And they are talking with Jesus, it says in our text. Luke's account tells us they are talking about his departure, which means how he went to Jerusalem and he had to die and depart to be with his father. This is a pretty holy conversation. This is insane. None of us are worthy to be in this conversation. But there's one dude in the disciples who feels the need to inject himself into this holy conversation. Because he has a disease that some of us have, which is called the foot-in-mouth disease. Which is where we say stuff before we think, 
And then we wish we could put our foot in our mouth. But it's too late. And so Pete, he comes out here. He's spitting wisdom. Peter says, Rabbi, it's, it's such a good Tuesday that we are, are here together. Uh, it's so good. Let's start a building project. Let's do like, the, like Simon Hodgson. Let's, let's build some tents. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Ons gaan kamp. It's going to be great. Let's camp. Now, with regards to Peter, you would have thought with Pete, after the last conversation that he had with Jesus, that he would have maybe kept his mouth shut just a bit, just a tad, because the last time he opened his mouth, he confessed Jesus to be the Christ, and then he rebuked the Christ that he just confessed. And then Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That would have shut me up for a month. <laughs> but Peter, he comes out there blurting, yeah, it's good that we're here. Let's build tents. Now, in all fairness to Pete, <laughs> I read in Luke's account, Luke 9.32, that they had just woken up. <laughs> and the lights are bright and Moses and Elijah are here. It's all pretty trippy, and he doesn't know what's potting, and he's just saying whatever comes into his head. And verse 6 goes on to say, For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. I love this line because it's so human. You know, Peter was the main source of Mark's gospel. In other words, he was the eyewitness that submitted to Mark, and Mark's writing from Peter's perspective, and Peter is like, guys, let me tell you, I said the dumbest thing up on that mountain, bro. Like, you guys don't understand. Like, Moses and Elijah were there, and I said this, bro. And then he's like, but let me just tell you, it's because I was absolutely petrified. I had no idea what to say. And can I tell you, if Jesus came in glory, none of us would know what to say. None of us would raise an objection. None of us would say, God, where were you when X? All we would be is terrified and not know what to say. For the glory of God would cause us to fall on our face and worship Him. So what's the point of all this? What's the point of this theophany, this appearance of God? Well, let's get to heading number four, the purpose of glory, because there's another layer unfolding in this account. As if Elijah and Moses wasn't enough, now... Verse 7, a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud. The word overshadowed them means it enveloped them at all sides. And this is the Shekinah cloud of glory from the Old Testament. This is the very glorious presence of God that led them in the wilderness that occupied the temple. This is insane that this is happening. And now it says this voice came from the cloud. And by the way, this voice would have been the same voice that they heard at Jesus' baptism that said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And now it says something very similar. It's the father speaking. The voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The father coming out there just to say, listen to my beloved son. By the way, listen to him is in the present continuous sense, meaning you must always Listen to him. Not just on the mountaintop, but in the valley in every moment of your life. Listen to him. You know, to listen to Christ isn't just to hear him out. It's actually to obey him. You know, my, my son Caleb is 16 months old. And when we tell him no, his reaction is to do the same thing again, but this time with a smile on his face. And while he does it, he shakes his head so that we know that he knows that this is not allowed and he's enjoying it all the more. If you, if you were a naughty child, can I just give you a warning from my side that uh, God has a sense of humor and he will probably bring you a naughty child. <laughs> and the point of this silly story is it's not that God is saying, I want you to hear out Jesus. God is saying, obey Jesus. Obey Him. And so the application for us is to obey Him, but Him alone. That means listen to no other religious leaders. That means listen not to other human voices. That means listen not to culture and to society. Listen to Him. Listen to Him and listen to Him alone. 
A Christian is a person that has surrendered the options and has said, my life is defined by listening and obeying Jesus. It says this in verse 8, and suddenly looking around, there was no longer anyone with them but Jesus alone. Elijah had stepped into the shadows. Moses had stepped into the shadows, for their work is done. They had pointed to Jesus. And now Jesus stands there alone, which is very apt because God will not share his glory with another. They've played their role, and the application for us is for us to step into the shadows as we point people to Jesus. That the greatest lives ever lived on this earth, we will not know their names because their life was defined by pointing people to Jesus and being forgotten at the end of the day. That is the mark of the greatest life here on earth. Being forgotten and Jesus remembered because of your life. That's the application. He stands there alone. And the application as well is to set your mind on Christ. Love Him. Follow Him. Adore Him. Serve Him. Worship Him. Obey Him. Imitate Him. It's Jesus standing alone on the mountain. Is He alone on the mountain of your heart? Does He stand unchallenged, supreme? in your thoughts. I know that all of us have some room to grow in this, and we will get back to that. But the purpose of glory is very clear. What happened on that mountain that day was that God wanted them to listen to Jesus. In particular, listen to him about the fact that Jesus said, I must die a terrible death on the cross. And if you want to be my disciple, you have to pick up your cross And follow me at great cost to your life as well. Listen to him. If it was not so difficult for us to live out this truth, it wouldn't be so heavily emphasized. But not only to listen to him about the cost, but also to see that beyond the rejection, there's a reward. And beyond the throne, sorry, beyond the thorns, there's a throne. And beyond the cross, there's a crown. And there is coming a day, no matter how difficult our life may be, And how high the cost may be, there is coming a day when Jesus comes clothed in radiant, splendorous power and majesty as King of kings and Lord of lords, riding on his white stallion, and he shall reward the faithful on that day. And every cost will be worth it. Every penny, every little bit of tear, every every bit of blood will be rewarded for in spades and crowns. It is worth the cost for the crown. When Jesus comes back, it will all be rewarded. And so as wrap up, us having taken our place, so to speak, on the mountain, us having seen in a sense what they have, us having heard what these guys have heard, we must live lives that responded the way that these men responded and that they were faithful to God even until the end. They had counted the cost because they had seen the crown. They had known the glory of God, and therefore they lived for the glory of God. Peter counted the cost. He, at the end of the day, for following Jesus, was crucified. But he felt it was not good for him to be crucified right way up, for he felt unworthy to be crucified the same way as Jesus. And so they crucified him upside down. And John... He was the only disciple who wasn't murdered for his faith, but he still lived out his life as an exile on Patmos, a political prisoner. These were men that had seen the glory of God and would live for the glory of God. I wonder if it's true for you today. I wonder if we are willing and brave enough to say, Lord, strip me down. We used to sing a song, everything I once held dear, I count it all as loss. Lead me to the cross where your blood poured out. Bring me to my knees. Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself. I belong to you. I wonder if we would be willing to be as bold to respond like that. Would you guys stand with me today? And the band's going to join me as well. Last week, when we were chatting about the cost of following Jesus with that difficult preach from Duncan, it's really the preach from Jesus. Duncan was just a mouthpiece. Dean and I were having a conversation afterwards, and he reminded me of this, that when you stand at your, on the, your wedding day, you stand at the altar, and you are willing to say, 
forsaking all others, I will be faithful to you. Speaking about your spouse. I've thought a lot about those words and I, mean, I meant them. But a Christian is a person who sees God as so glorious that they are willing to say, forsaking all others, the world and everything, I will be faithful to Jesus. And if I'm honest with you, it hit me hard when Dean said that because I've thought a lot more about forsaking all others for my spouse than I have about Jesus. And in Luke 14, 26, Jesus tells us, if you're not willing to forsake mother and father and brother and sister, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And that's not a fancy category of Christian. That's just a Christian. A Christian is someone who is willing to forsake everything and say, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. But there's one massive difference between the marriage vow and this vow with Jesus. On the marriage day, we say, forsaking all others until death us do part. But with Jesus, if we forsake all else and follow him, it's forsaking all others until death us do unite. For at the end of the cost of following Jesus is the crown. And you know what the crown is? The true crown, the biggest crown? It's being with Jesus. He's the ultimate crown. That's why I've called this sermon the ultimate crown. There are other benefits to following Jesus. And if we were to list them all, we'd be here for a long time. But there's also a great cost to following Jesus. But neither of those things are ultimate. The thing that's ultimate is do you love Jesus? And at the end of your life is the thing that you're looking forward to is being with Him. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save who? Those who are eagerly awaiting Him. I wonder if that's you today, that Jesus is your crown. That as imperfect as you are, as imperfect as I am, and we, we're going to stumble and fumble our way following Jesus, I wonder if our heart posture is right. That as imperfect as I am, my heart's desire is to love Jesus and be with Him forever. If that's the case, <clears throat> if that's the case, then we have a great thing to look forward to. The second coming of Christ. The day of coronation. Because Jesus is looking for a bride. A bride who wants Jesus. And so then we will sing with our hands up high and with our voices loud and proud. We will sing like a bride waiting for her groom. We'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King. Even so, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Let's sing and let's praise Him.